uh, tonight we're going to be presenting uh, tomorrow's Yellowstone. So thank you to all of you in the room and for our guests who are uh, tuning in online. Um, I'm Kelly Tyrell, and I work in the Office of Strategic Communication here at UW-Madison. Uh, today's event, Tomorrow's Yellowstone, marks uh, 2024's third installment of the Crossroads of Ideas program series. Uh, the Crossroads of Ideas series is a collaboration between the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery's Illuminating Discovery Hub, uh, UW-Madison, and the Mortgage Institute for Research. It's an opportunity to foster a dialogue between the community and local scientists. The series addresses issues that affect all of us and highlights important research that's happening in Wisconsin, and as you'll hear about tonight, beyond. Uh, since 2014, Crossroads has been a staple of public programming offered at the Discovery Building um, right here on the UW-Madison campus. So tonight, as we're gonna talk about uh, tomorrow's Yellowstone, it's a multimedia story project, and we're really excited to be here to talk about it. The project is focused on a really important long-term research study at Yellowstone National Park and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. You're gonna hear from some of the people involved in both the science and the storytelling project. Um, and that includes the researchers and that includes the storytellers in my office, Strategic Communication, who went to the field last summer to document the work. Um, some of you might already be familiar with the Multimedia Storytelling Project if you looked at it ahead of tonight. Otherwise, there's a QR code on the slide, so feel free to line your phones up there and you can pull up the story there. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to check it out anytime. We'll get a little bit of a sneak peek of, of uh, some of what the project has to offer tonight. Um, so we're gonna engage in conversation and we're gonna leave ample time, we hope, uh, for audience Q&A, both for those of you here in the room and also um, online. But first, to get us started, we're gonna take a look at a little short version of a longer video that you'll find on the Yellowstone, Tomorrow's Yellowstone website. Assuming it wants to work. Computers decided it's had enough of this cold weather. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's Yay. one there. Is this something on the screen? Yellowstone is so well known, it's the world's first national park. It's a good place to help people appreciate the magnitude of climate change and to do so in a place that people, they, they love. The climate seems to us to be changing at a faster rate than the tree species are even able to adapt and keep up. This is just such a cool reminder that the science that we do um, matters for people. And we want to engage people in that process and share what we find to make people's lives better. Here's step three. Yellowstone is going to look different in the future, but how different it will become depends on all of us. Here's just a bite-sized morsel more to be had on the, uh, the project website. Um, so that video was created by two of the people sitting up at the table today, Alyssa Mahan and Jason Weiss, who's at the very end, uh, and they're two of the people that you'll hear from today. Um, we're gonna get started hearing more about the project. Um, and then Alyssa, I'm gonna have you kick us off, introduce yourself, and maybe the rest of the panelists can too. And in the meantime, I'm gonna see if I can get our slideshow going. All right, can everyone hear me okay? 
Awesome. Cool. So my name is Alyssa Mahan, and I'm a science communicator here at the university. Um, so I work with Kelly and a couple of our other colleagues to help cover research across the university. Um, and I also have a background in video journalism, so I try to bring that into my work whenever I can to show people science in the field and a, a behind-the-scenes look as well. I'm Monica Turner. I'm a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology. I've been here since 1994, which is hard to believe. And uh, you'll hear more from me as we go along. Uh, hi, I'm Timon Keller. I'm a PhD student with Dr. Monica Turner. And I work on a variety of different projects trying to understand mechanisms of tree re regeneration following wildfires out in Yellowstone. And I'm very excited to be here tonight. I'm Althea Dotzer, and I'm a photographer with Strategic Communications. I'm Jason Weiss. I'm a video producer and videographer with University of Strategic Communications. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm going to take a seat with you in a moment, but I'm going to keep trying to troubleshoot this. Um, and I'm going to hand Alyssa her computer to log back in for us. <laughs> um, but that's actually OK, because the first question uh, we have tonight is actually for Monica. Uh, Monica, you've been here for some time. <laughs> um, and you have a long and personal history at Yellowstone. Can you tell us a little bit more about your research and interest there and how you came to study wildfire in such an iconic place? Yeah, happy to do so and happy to be here tonight. Um, I first, <clears throat> excuse me, encountered Yellowstone as a 19-year-old college student. I spent the summer there between my sophomore and junior year and um, had worked at Old Faithful as a ranger nat naturalist through the Student Conservation Association. And I grew up on Long Island. You can probably hear that if you know your New York accents. And this was my first time even going west of the Poconos, I think. <laughs> so it ended up being a very formative summer for me. It's what made me decide to go into ecology instead of going into veterinary medicine. Apologies to Chris and Claudia in the audience. Um, but it shifted my goal towards earning a PhD in ecology. And I thought at that time that I'd be a professor at a very small school, ha, huh? and then um, that I would be a ranger during the summer. But that was before I discovered how much I loved research. So my National Parks connection continued while I was in graduate school. I worked for the Park Service in the Washington office for a summer. I also did field work in Virgin Islands National Park and on Cumberland Island National Seashore. And my focus for my dissertation work did include natural disturbances, including fire. Now, fast forward 10 years from that watershed summer, and I had an opportunity to start a new project with a collaborator um, in Yellowstone that would continue some of the work that I was doing with computer simulation models of disturbances like wildfire. And my colleague had fire history maps in, of, um, yellow, in Yellowstone, so it was a really great opportunity. And so we spent a week in the park during July of 1988. And any of you who remember the summer of 1988, that was the beginning of the epic wildfire season um, the, of the 1988 Yellowstone fires. And that summer was extremely dry. There had been no rain for months, and there were high winds, and lightning is the source of ignition. So the fires are naturally started. They ended up burning about one third of the park and they gave us a really wonderful natural experiment in which uh, we could study the effects of forest fires on a natural ecosystem. And then I've continued the research in Yellowstone for, um, it's now 35 years and counting, so we do have a long-term study. So the research has evolved over the years. We've had uh, quite a lot of surprises, and we've also had challenges to our understanding. And I just want to highlight a few of those things. So in 1988, when the fires were so big, so severe, we're maybe a little blasé about that now because we hear it so much each summer. But everyone thought at that time that the forest was destroyed. And that was true for the scientists as well as the managers. We were concerned that it might not recover. We even thought maybe the soils were sterilized because everything looked so blackened and it looked much like a moonscape. But the reality was, reality was far different. The most striking thing about the response of the forest to those fires was the rapid recovery. So the trees just regenerated in droves the year after the fire. You could put your foot down and step on 20 or 30 little baby pine seedlings at the same time. 
the native wildflowers re-sprouted because the fires didn't burn deeply into the soil, so their roots survived. They bloomed two years after the fire, and the wildflowers were just spectacularly. They were astonishingly beautiful with the backdrop of the charred trees. We also found that the invasive species we expected to come in and take over did not. It was the natives that recovered and did so well. And we also discovered just that these were natural events. As we learned more about the history and even the paleo history, that these fires occur, the system is well adapted to it, and really the bottom line was how resilient or how able they are to recover from those fires. So now, fast forward another 20 years after the 88 fires. And at that point, after studying those fires for 20 years, I thought Yellowstone was, those forests were resilient to anything. Climate change was not going to be a problem. We thought everything would be fine. But at that point, we were starting to see some of the effects of climate change. And the projections of future climate were suggesting that summers like 1988 would become the norm, not the exception. They're still the uh, driest and windiest summer that we have in the instrumental record. So that was kind of a shock. And then as we thought about what would happen if the changes in climate exceeded what we've observed for the past 10,000 years, we just hadn't thought about it that way. We thought the variability that we'd seen over recent millennia, or 10,000 years, would be adequate to predict what was, would happen in the future. But if we're taking excursions away or far out of that, what would that mean? So then we've started thinking, well, hotter, drier summers, that's going to give us more fires and more frequent fires and maybe larger and more severe fires. So we began to start asking, what would that mean for the forest? Could it still maintain its resilience? And we started working on questions like, well, if the fires burn before the trees have grown up enough to produce cones so that there's a seed supply to regenerate afterwards, what would happen? And then if the seeds are there, is the climate going to be suitable? Like, will the seeds be able to still germinate and establish and grow? So these are the questions that we've been working on now for about the past 10 years. We wanted to know how the forest would change and what Yellowstone might look like in the future, thinking about the mechanisms and what that means. So we focused a lot on that. We're already seeing some examples in the field of the loss of the ability to recover, not everywhere, but in places. And our computer models suggest that we might see quite a reduction in the extent of forest and a big change in the landscape if climate change continues unabated. So this led to um, the Camp Monaco Prize, which also led to the development of the project that we're talking about tonight when we had the uh, team from University Communications with us in the field. So I just want to make a couple of other comments about doing research in Greater Yellowstone. One is that it's been intellectually really exciting. So we're trying to understand how an iconic place, a big natural area, functions, how it works, and how it responds to the changes that we're seeing in the environment. Um, the second thing is it's been a wonderful place for training young scientists. So four of the students currently in my lab, including Timon, are doing their doctoral studies in Yellowstone. And I've had 13 graduate students do their theses and dissertations out there another 10 postdocs, and innumerable undergraduates who have gotten their exposure to research by coming out in the field with us. So it's been a great training ground. Um, and then the last thing I would say is I still love the hands-on research, so it's a good place for me to keep my boots on the ground. Thanks, Monica. I think you've talked about Yellowstone as a living laboratory. And I really just love the, the imagery of that. It's a, a place accessible to all of us, right, as a national park, and yet also a place where really important science is being done. Um, speaking of, Timon, you're a graduate student in Monica's lab. Can you tell us a little bit about the projects that you're working on and uh, what you were doing in the field last summer? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I work on a variety of different projects, and they employ different uh, approaches. So I use some field studies, um, focusing on nutrient cycling out in the GYE, um, and I use uh, simulation models to uh, try and understand how regeneration is going to be affected by novel climate scenarios going forward throughout the 21st century. And that set of studies um, is really designed to answer how forests might respond to a different fire and different climate out in Yellowstone, and what might be the key mechanisms behind that um, driving that change. 
So broadly, I'm really interested in, in fire and how fire shapes ecosystems. And that interest for me really started when I was in college. I went to uh, a really small school in Southern Illinois uh, that is kind of famous, I guess, for having the largest college campus in the United States. And 99% of that is undeveloped. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for active land management. And so I had a chance to um, play around with fire, which to a college freshman is really exciting when you get to go out into the woods and set things aflame. Um, but I think I was also really interested in fire because of the connection um, to people. Uh, different peoples have very different um, responses to fire on the landscape and approach it differently. For example, Europeans in North America felt very differently about fire as, as Native Americans did, for example. And I've always really appreciated and valued that connection between people and landscapes and ecosystems. Um, and I think that was something that was ingrained in me growing up in Germany, right on the old border between East and West, right, where landscapes are shaped by different political systems and where something like a river forms a really stark boundary between people. Um, so I've always appreciated that connection between people and the environment. Um, and when I started college, I was pretty certain that I was going to be on the people side of things and major in politics and photography. Um, and definitely not in STEM. I took like a general education science class to avoid ever having to step foot into uh, the science center ever again. And then um, due to some good mentorship, um, I ended up majoring in biology. And like I said, got really interested in fire there. Um, and then after college, really wanted to take um, the insights that we were generating through science and turn those into management solutions that work for both people and um, the environment and the places that um, we're in. Um, so I decided to go to graduate school for a master's in environmental management. Um, and through that, got involved uh, developing and implementing a forest management plan for a ranch out in Colorado. Um, and forests out there have also evolved with fire, but in very different ways, where fire there usually historically shouldn't burn the entire forest, but just the understory. But what has happened there with fire suppression is that the forests became denser and now fires burn very differently and have the risk to um, destroy a lot of the forest. And so we go into those forests and restore them by manually thinning um, the forest. So before coming here, I actually cut down a lot of trees, um, which is kind of the opposite to what I do now. Um, and while working um, on those projects, I kept asking a lot of questions that I didn't know the answer to. So we cut these trees, but what might happen to ecosystem processes? What might happen if we bring fire back to this ecosystem that hasn't seen it in a while? And oftentimes there weren't answers to those questions and I certainly wasn't equipped to answer them. So that's when I decided to go back to graduate school um, and uh, got in touch with Monica through a mutual connection of ours and started working um, on a variety of different projects out in Yellowstone. And the one um, that took me out there this last summer is one where we are taking um, the simulation modeling results that we have that show that forests are going to change throughout the 21st century and that there's gonna be extensive forest loss and take those results and turn them into photorealistic visualizations of what that might actually look like on the landscape. Because it's one thing to say there's gonna be a 50% reduction in forest cover on the landscape, but what does that actually look like when you get to see it in a picture? Um, and the reason for doing that is to try to develop more intuitive methods of science communication and to communicate that change in a landscape that a lot of people feel connected to and that carries kind of this significance in American culture and in conservation history generally as Yellowstone being the first national park. Um, so we went out in 2022 um, and took a bunch of pictures at scenic sites that people were likely to see. Um, we edited those to reflect different climate scenarios. And then we went out and showed them to visitors um, to essentially ask, are these pictures effective at communicating the effects of climate change? And do visitors to Yellowstone have preferences uh, for different kinds of landscapes and different future climate scenarios? And some of those findings um, from the visitor survey that we used while we were showing folks those pictures uh, were really cool. They showed that when you initially ask folks about what they thought of climate change and how it was gonna affect Yellowstone, it followed a predictable kind of political uh, leaning with conservatives thinking there would be less climate change effects and liberals thinking there would be more. But afterwards, after showing them these images, the perception of climate change increased for all 
uh, political affiliations, so liberals and conservatives, which is really, which was really exciting. Um, and then the final takeaway from that study was that people really prefer uh, current forested conditions, right? What Yellowstone looks like right now is something um, we've become quite attached to. So that's what took me out there this last summer. Thank you, Timon. Um, I'm a little biased, and I think uh, the communicators up here are too, but science communication matters, <laughs> which is a nice segue into a question uh, I'd like to pose to you, Alyssa. Um, can you share how you and Althea and Jason came to be involved in Monica and Timon's work, and, and others, I should also acknowledge, is a, a much larger study team, including some folks who are here in the room. Um, science doesn't happen, you know, with just a couple of people toiling away. It's a, it's a broad endeavor, um, and Monica has been really great about training and giving opportunities to lots of students, as she talked about. But how did you come to, to get involved, and, and how did tomorrow's Yellowstone come about? Yeah, I'll also add that some of the photos that Timon um, made to help communicate that those future changes are in this slideshow as well. So they're labeled with photo illustration. Um, so as those go through, you should be able to see some of what he was showing people out in the field as well. Um, but yeah, so university communications or strategic communications got involved um, over a year ago now. It Yeah, we started in... Um, the early winter before um, this past summer. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> so Monica came to us initially asking for help, creating a video about um, her lab's work so that she could communicate it um, to the public as part of a grant that she received actually from the Prince of Monaco Foundation, <laughs> or from the Monaco Foundation and from the Draper uh, Natural History Museum, which is out in Cody, Wyoming. Um, and so, very quickly during those initial meetings of figuring out what she wanted this video to be like, my brain started spinning and I was like, oh wait, but there's so much more story here. And I wonder if the best way to actually tell this is to go with them and show people the narrative behind the science that they're doing and show people what it's like on the ground, behind the scenes, to be someone who's passionate about this work and to be working with um, you know, this natural system that is so unique and iconic to so many people. Um, and so I kind of flipped it back on them and with the ask of, can we actually do this huge project instead? <laughs> Which is a lot to ask of um, researchers who are just trying to get out there and get their data, um, while of course they also recognize that um, you know, communicating science is really important. So in the end, we um, brainstormed a whole lot, planned before we got out there, had a, so a script and um, storyline and an idea of what we wanted to put together, um, and then got all the permits to sort of make it happen. And um, yeah, it started out small. And then I said, what if we made it bigger? And other people said, yeah. Actually, that would be a really cool opportunity. Let's maximize on this and get out there in the nitty gritty and show people what it looks like. Thanks, Alyssa. I should say too that a project like this, a storytelling project like this, also doesn't happen because of the hard work of, of a few. There are many people in our office, you've heard us say strategic communication, university communications, that's the same thing. Um, but you know, there was a broader team that, that worked on this too. Before we go to Althea though, I wanna, by a show of hands, who's been to Yellowstone before? Wow, most yeah. of you. Yeah, so you probably all have memories and experiences there that, that stand out to you and, um, and are important. Confession, I have never been to Yellowstone. I have to go. Um, but that does segue us into our next question, which Althea, what, can you share a little bit about what it was like um, as a photographer, not explicitly a science communicator, um, being out in the field? And, uh, you know, Alyssa just kind of described how it was a, a small ask for a video at first, small, I, I'll put that in air quotes, video <laughs> production is difficult, I don't do it, but I respect it. Um, and that actually snowballed into something bigger. So can you talk about the importance of, of being there? Definitely. Um, going to this project, I really wanted to give the readers an organic sense for what being a field researcher is like. Um, I wanted to have it where you're looking at the pictures and get a sense for how gritty it is and how organic the experience is. 
from waking up and packing your sandwiches and heading out into the field to hiking through thick forest to look using a GPS signal for where your um, site selection was um, to doing your laundry in a national park. I wanted to kind of embed to give our readers a sense for that. Um, and I also wanted to show people what science is like kind of from the inside out. So rather than just reading about the latest scientific research like I often do in the newspaper, I wanted to kind of give more of a sense for what it's like to make that research and what um, researchers do on a daily basis. And in order to do that, we had to build a lot of trust. We had to start out before we left getting to know each other, talking about what our goals were, um, getting to know each other as people. It's not something you can achieve quickly and just kind of go in and get a couple sound bites. We really had to get to know each other. And then in the field, um, spending multiple days together hiking through the woods and also sharing meals and getting to know each other helped create a sense of intimacy and connection that allowed, gave us greater access um, as communicators and allowed us to get some of the photos and videos that I think can bring the, the readers into the story more intimately. Um, so it pays off to get to connect and um, know each other as humans. And then another nice thing about being in the field and really being there for um, a week was to be able to get some of those scene setting pictures. You've all mostly been to Yellowstone, but the beauty and the grandeur um, and the magic of the place is something we really wanted to have central to this story because climate change is a tough topic and to make it um, feel like the type of story that people could connect with and get behind, we wanted to bring people to the place. And so sometimes that meant waking up at 5.30 and driving for an hour to get to the Snake River where four four o'clock <laughs> and uh, wading into the Snake River to get that, that morning light on the mountain that we wanted to get to share with everybody. Um, and by telling it this way, I hope that the reader can get some of that texture and the magic of Yellowstone, which helps hopefully them feel more um, more open to and receptive to the, the science that we're also sharing. Thanks, Althea. Um, and I think we've heard in a couple of different ways that there was a lot of planning that, that was involved in this trip. Uh, maybe, Jason, could you speak to some of that a little bit, the work you all did to prepare and how you navigated the knowns and the unknowns once you arrived? Lots of unknowns, yeah, that happens. Uh, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the preparation, like like uh, Alyssa said, we we started looking at this almost a year, six months before we actually went out. <coughs> Excuse me. And from there, it's it's finding the story. And okay, yeah, um, M Monica has information she has to get out, but what else can we extrapolate from that? And building the story and the science beats that are going to go into all the information that we get to put out. <coughs> and then figuring out what the visual components are that are gonna help to support that. And to that extent, you go out there, you have a plan, okay, we wanna get this, that's gonna show this, we wanna get this, we wanna show that. But then you have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to see, okay, this isn't working. Uh, what else can we do? Or uh, if we can communicate, talking to each other and checking in was a huge part of what we did. And like, hey, I got, I saw this moment happen, like Timon was talking with these guests and we got this great soundbite and I think that'll really help with this. We can work with each other to kind of fill in the gaps that we need to or pivot in, like I said earlier, pivot into a new direction of how we can tell this aspect of what's going on out there. Um, and to build on what Althea was saying in the relationship building, it's not just getting to know each other and being comfortable around each other because I mean, we are, one of the pictures you saw there was us in their food tent, like with a very wide angle lens because we are right on top of each other. You want to be comfortable in that moment when you're hanging out with people like that. And you want them to be comfortable with you too and with cameras in their faces looking at their very, you know, what otherwise is a kind of very private moment. They live in a trailer on, <laughs> on park grounds. Um, 
so yeah, being able to build those relationships, making people comfortable. You talk about how they want to be able to tell their story because ultimately that's what this is and you want to be able to do that for them. You want to tell the best version of that story for them and you also get to learn things that you might not have otherwise known about. Like we ended up tracing through the woods with Ariel, um, who's not here today, but you see her in the photos there in a, just by happenstance because she was talking about it. And she's like, oh, it's probably not that far. I'm just going to this thing. I'm like, that actually sounds really cool. We're going to come with you. And yeah, just being able to make the moments happen when you can. Thanks, Jason. Um, and for as much we're complaining as goes into communication, the scientific side of things is so much planning, right? And then you get there, and, and very similarly, you're adapting, right, to the conditions when you're actually in the field and something unexpectedly breaks or the trail you need to access your, your samples is suddenly closed. Um, Monica, can you talk a little bit about what it's like, um, you know, trying doing the work to sort of add the additional work of science communication, working with professionals, but but why that's actually really important to you as a scientist? Certainly, um, and I would say that the research that we do is just not for its own sake. And I mean, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Wisconsin idea, and that really does infuse a lot of what we do here. Um, in terms of making our research both available and relevant to a broader community. But I also just love to share my science and my excitement for it with people. I also want people to know that scientists are normal folks. We're just normal folks who, the, who happen to do science, but I think that's important as well. But um, it, with respect to Yellowstone too, I really wanna see, have people appreciate the value of the parks for science and not only for recreation. Um, Kelly mentioned the living laboratories idea, but they really are, and they're so important for us because we don't have very many places that are baselines or references where we have a lighter touch from, from humanity. And so Yellowstone is extremely special in that way, and um, I, I would like people to see that, 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 that they're really scientifically valuable. Um, the resource managers are another really important uh, group for us to communicate with, and we put a high priority on maintaining good relationships and partnering, actually, with our resource managers. They don't have the time nor the training to do the science and generate the data, so we often provide information and understanding that is then the foundation of the decisions that they make for management. And um, I would say also most of our work is publicly funded, and so I feel a strong obligation to share whatever we're finding with the people who need that information or um, who want it. But none of this would happen without having the folks that are around us here because, I mean, we're scientists, we're not professional communicators. And so being able to work with people who know what to do and how to do this is just absolutely crucial to making our messages more impactful and being able to do it. I mean, we have not the time nor the ability. So um, it's truly a, very much a team effort. And I am, I, t I tell, tell Kelly this all the time, I am so grateful to be a professor at this university and have such resources and talent all working together um, with the trust and the relationship that you guys have, have been mentioning. I don't take that for granted. Well, and we appreciate you immensely, Monica. Um, it's a, a really good segue, you, you know, you mentioned you're not science communicators, but literally part of Timon's project last summer was science communication to fuel science, which is fascinating. Um, Timon, do you think that publicly communicating about your work is important um, to you as a scientist? And has this project or the science communication that you've engaged in thus far in your, your career influenced how you think as a scientist? Um, yeah, so I, I really think that engaging people, um, especially the people that live and work um, and have some connection to the ecosystems and the places we study, involving them in the research that we do um, is, is really important. Um, and I kind of think about doing that in, in two different ways. Uh, one is definitely the, the communication part that I want to come back to in just a moment. Um, but I think this other part to engaging people in research is what Monica mentioned, that um, you can directly incorporate people's interests, people's questions in your research and let that inform um, what you actually study uh, if it ends up being related, right, to what you're interested in and in to what your skill set happens to be. Um, and I think that was something that 
I developed um, while I was working in management, right? That a lot of management is weighing what is best for an ecosystem with what do people want? What do people need? How can we bring those together um, and come up with a solution that works for everybody? And I think at the same time, though, it's important to recognize when that synthesis just isn't there between a researcher and what um, the interests of a particular community are. Um, and I think relationships right, with people are best if they're genuine. And I think the same is true between scientists and stakeholders. Right? If that genuine overlap just isn't there, then um, it's OK to maybe go separate paths and work on separate things, but remain positive and friendly uh, relationships. And I think that then relates um, to the second part, right? which is the once we've created the science, um, once we've generated insights, how do we effectively um, share them with people? And I think that's yeah really important, and that's part of why I wanted this to be an entire chapter of my dissertation, is all of this work and this effort that we put into understanding the ecosystem scientifically. How can we help um, folks who don't look at data 40 hours a week? Um, how can we help them get those same insights um, that we're getting from this? Um, so I think that science communication is really important. And in that, uh, for me, it's been really fun to think about the way that I think about something, the way that something is most intuitive for me to understand might not be the most intuitive way for other folks, right? And to really kind of take that like step like outside of myself, right, and see how can I communicate this in ways that resonate most um, with other people at other places um, in, yeah, at other places in life, wherever um, they might be. And um, for how this particular project affected um, my research or how I approach research, I think really considering um, the broader framing and the narrative, right, um, you've heard a lot about like, the, what's the bigger picture here? What other stories can we tell? And to really have that be a deliberate thought at the beginning of the process um, really, yeah, was impactful to me. And then another thing that you've heard from these folks is just how much time they spend planning this and how much time they put into and thought they put into kind of setting up to be ready for those really special moments when they occur, right? And the skill they have to then capture those moments genuinely and be flexible enough to see whatever those moments might be, because they might be something else than what you originally uh, expected. And I want to be able to kind of do that in my science, right? That it's structured and planned enough um, so that I can get to a point where interesting discoveries might happen, and that once I get there, I'm flexible enough to see what they are, and that I hopefully have the skills uh, to make something of them. Thanks, Jason. You had a really beautiful phrase to describe that. Do you recall? <laughs> <laughs> I'm told it was serendipity of opportunity. <laughs> Sure was. And Timon, um, just to quickly piggyback on what you were saying, um, what do you hope that people take from the communication, yeah. right? W especially around a, a topic like climate change? Um, I really hope that, especially through these images, that they're able to engage um, with them in a way, in whatever way makes the most sense to them, right? That we avoid language that is often politically charged around climate change, that we can avoid negative emotions like fear, for example, and really just give people an opportunity um, to engage with it themselves and give people the agency to make sense of it um, for themselves um, by seeing what this might actually look like, right? And then if they're curious um, to learn more, we gave people an entire list of other resources, right? Ranging from like very basic two minute YouTube videos on forests and climate change to like, here's like the source code for the model that we right if people really get into it um, so kind of empowering people giving them agency to engage with it in a way that makes sense for them thanks Simone and I actually want to open that question up so it'll be a la our last question and then we're going to take questions from all of you but um, I want to hear from from everyone up here um, you know climate change is a is a polarizing subject right many of us might feel as if it shouldn't be but the reality is that it is um, and so I'm curious, both for the scientists and Timon, you gave us some insight uh, from your perspective, but Monica too, how do you navigate this while talking to people in the parks, while you're out in the field, um, or as you are engaging non-scientists with your work? And then also for the storytellers and thinking about how your audiences might receive the, the final product. Yeah, that's a, it's a challenge, I will say that much. Um, but what I have always found is that when we're out there, when we're conducting our studies in the field, we're usually traipsing around with equipment and backpacks and all sorts of things. So when we encounter visitors in the field, they are always super interested in what we're doing. They'll stop us and say, why are you here? What are you doing? 
And so it gives us an opportunity on a one-on-one -on -one basis to explain things to people and to reach them when they're not in their normal environment. And I think just by being in the place that that makes a huge difference in terms of um, teachable moments, so to speak. So it doesn't require politic politicization at all. Um, the other thing is, I mean, so many of you raised your hands that you've been to Yellowstone. So many people feel connected to Yellowstone, and it's not only within the United States where people do a you know family vacation to Yellowstone. It's a highlight of the kids growing up, or you know, multi generational trips and the like. It's also known worldwide, and I think that it gives a way to reach people so that they can understand what the consequences of climate change will be in a place that everyone loves and that so many people have connections to. So I. I, I don't find it difficult to talk about out there. It's sometimes hard not to be um, depressing about it, you know? So one of the things that I hope people will see from the imagery that we've created and that Timon has used for um, his dissertation research to realize that if we can get climate change under control, we will not see the extreme changes in Yellowstone. And if you can show that to people in a way that, that they can grasp, it's not a graph, it's not a data table, you know, it's not the 40 hours in front of a computer. Um, I think that's a way to um, sort of do it in a way that's not threatening. I can go next. Um, yeah, kind of jumping off of that, we had a lot of conversations with you all, um, the research team, beforehand about how we didn't want this to be a gloom and doom climate change piece because those are so easily dismissible and we're like constantly seeing pieces like that. But then on the flip side, there are audiences who don't even believe in climate change. So how do you break through the white noise of what people are hearing all the time and maybe actually get people to listen to you regardless of what they believe. Um, so my training was in video journalism and photo journalism. So I uh, am biased, but I really believe in the power of narrative storytelling um, and that showing people, the people behind science, how much they care about it, um, how passionate they are, um, weird little quirks that they have about you know being in the field, um, it makes people like scientists and interested in the science and the things that they're passionate about. Um, and then it also just brings everyone on the same playing field in a way of we're all people, we all care about this iconic landscape. And uh, if I learn about it more, maybe I'm also emboldened to do something about it and to help protect it. Um, and I know that in my own personal life, you know, I've shared narrative stories that I've worked on, that other people have worked on with family members who maybe have opposing political views from me. Like my grandfather, I know that I've had a lot of conversations with him about climate change. Um, and while I don't think that I'm going to change his mind just from one story that I do, I know that we're having a lot more conversations about it because of these types of stories, because of people that he is seeing and connecting with through these kinds of stories. Um, so that's inspirational for me. I'm early career, maybe I'm not jaded yet, but <laughs> um, yeah, I really believe in that power and think that everybody up here felt that from working together on this piece as well. Jason, over you. Anything to add? <laughs> I don't know how to follow that up. I mean, that sums it up pretty beautifully, yeah. I mean, part of part of my job also, is, I feel, is to let the scientists tell the science. I, I have just going to step back, let them do their thing, and show it as best as I can and as unbiased as I can. But yeah, I, I have a bias towards the beauty that is there. I want to show people with what that looks like and hopefully just bring them into that space and make them realize, okay, this is where we are, this is what's happening, and these are who these people actually are. Yeah, I would say I went into this story looking for ways to create that common ground through a, um, a common understanding of the beauty of the place and a common understanding of just how much we can love um, place and the animals and the flowers and the stillness and also the connection to the people and I feel like you can tell a pretty complicated story once you have a good common ground that everyone feels um, 
connected to. And so those were the two pieces I think I was trying to elevate in the storytelling to give the words and the, the larger scientific story um, that grounding. Thanks, Sophia. All right, now it's your turn. Questions from the audience. All right, this, oh, oh yep, we have a mic in the back. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, what uh, are the evaluative tools, if any, that you're using for the project so that you can know who your audience is um, and receive feedback from them, not only on their like reactions to the presentation of the story, but also the information. And then are you, if you are doing that, are you then coming back together as a whole group to be able to discuss how that will impact future collabor collaborative projects? Yeah, great question, which is basically how are we evaluating the effectiveness of the project? I can take this one. Um, yeah, so we have normal sorts of metrics measurements that um, we use for uh, social media engagement um, and our website engagement as well. Um, so we actually saw really interesting numbers for this. Um, the We had um, basically people who came to the site stayed on for uh, a longer time than is average for website use. And we actually saw that the data showed people returned to look at it again, which was really cool and really encouraging. Um, and so we're continuing to look at um, over a longer period of time and as we reshare and repackage these things as well, how it continues to be received um, by our audiences. This is also, the second time, the first time in a long time that we have done a project like this with this approach. Um, so it was definitely a learn as you go um, and take a step back and reflect on uh, what happened and how you can improve when you try this again, which is something that I really want to be doing more of. Um, yeah, so a big learning experience and we saw pretty good engagement from our audience so far, lots of buy-in um, and return to dive into the stories a little bit more. And thanks all of you for being here because you're part of this, <laughs> right? You are, you are proof that, so, that what we, we did is, is reaching people. Yeah, question over here. How do you have different audiences for this? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're all talking about the same thing and you're patting each other on the back and it was great. <laughs> but how how are, are are other people even engaged in this? Yeah, how so how the question is how are we reaching people, you yes. know, beyond the people in this room? Monica, can you talk a little bit about your work in Wyoming? Sure, I can. So there, there's a couple of ways. One is that the um, the national parks have interpretive programs, and so not th there's there's sort of two different projects here products here. One was a video that was a deliverable from my grant that provided the partial support for this that was written into the grant. So that video is going to be displayed at the Draper Museum. Uh, that's the Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody in in Wyoming. So that gets a lot of visitors coming through. And again, that's specifically for the communications product. product. Um, Timon is going to be publishing the work on the, the photo images that were done and also the visitor surveys. So we have data on how visitors have responded to our product. So that's there as well. Um, we have found also in the past, because we did another video from my lab with University Communications some years ago, and it's been used quite widely in um, teaching classrooms. So you can use, you know, like four to eight minute videos if you're teaching a general ecology class or a forest ecology class. So I have no data on it because I don't track it, but, um, but I do know from people contacting me that that's useful. And then of course we publish our primary data papers in the real literature. Yeah, Not that this yeah. is fake, but you know, the <laughs> peer reviewed literature. <laughs> Evidence based. Always, yeah. yeah, that's that's always out there. Yeah. Well, it's also fun. It's it's what we need to do. Yep. And, and we appreciate all of you sharing. If you leave here and you feel inspired with you know people in in your circles, and we have a lot of partners on campus and the Wisconsin Foundation Alumni Association. So there there are legs. The product is the site, but we we continue to share it in a variety of ways. 
our, our social media strategist is sitting behind you and she's also helping us think through you know, how we reach different audiences at different times in different places. Um, all right, next question here at the front. Um, for the researchers, uh, Monica and, and Timon, um, I applaud your willingness to tell your story and uh, tell the research story in a different way. I think you've inserted yourself more into it. Um, for the storytellers, Alyssa, Althea, and Jason, um, what I'm seeing here tonight in, in the photos that are kind of shared in the, in the backdrop here is a lot more of a, a nice surprise of seeing yourself as storytellers in the story that's being told. And how does that, for any of you, how does that change your perception of what it means to tell a story about research um, and also allow yourself to be a little bit more vulnerable and perhaps part of that story? So what is it like to tell the story but also be in it? Um, I'll say for me, it makes the process easier, actually, in a way. Um, like Jason alluded to earlier, there were moments in the field that we didn't know were going to happen. And if we were just doing an interview here in Madison and I was trying to get details about what it's like on the ground, I wouldn't have even known to ask those questions. But being with them in the field and seeing what it's like for them, um, you know, you just get that more intimate access and it's a really rare, cool opportunity um, that I think just adds new layers to the story that we were able to tell. Um, and yeah, push beyond just the science and the amazingness of the place and into you know these people. I might add that I think while we were while we were in Yellowstone, I was like a radar for stories and for moments, and I couldn't turn it off. Like there was, I, it was just like everywhere, and so it encompassed our team in a way as well as the, the larger story we were, we were making. And it, it felt, um, being there like that was a piece of it. And we didn't use a lot of these behind the scenes pictures in the, the products that we did, but it, it was kind of just part of capturing all of the, the experience because it, it felt related. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that, unfortunately. I, I don't ever feel like I'm part of the story, so seeing that, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I was there. But I just kind of, <laughs> I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm working, but I'm also getting to enjoy the work, and I kind of forget sometimes that it is work, so it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of way to live. I'll add one more, mo oh, Timon, you want to go? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, there was a really cool moment that we couldn't have had um, if we weren't in the field with them. When we actually landed and first were getting to our, um, the place that we were staying near their um, camper van. We were driving through Grand Teton um, towards where Grand Teton and Yellowstone almost meet, like where they're closer together. Um, and going through all of these vast fields and you see the Teton Mountains and it's beautiful. And like every time that we turned on the road, we were like, oh my gosh, whoa, like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and I was like, this is why we're here. It's because of the majesty of the place. It's so exciting and beautiful. And I wouldn't even know how to describe this in words. And then we turn suddenly on the road and it's just lines and lines of burnt trees. And the, I kind of felt that like settle over me. And I was like, the immensity of this and the stark contrast to the green and the lush that we were just going through and awed by, that is why we're here to show people that, yes, fire is natural in this place, but if we don't do something, we might lose the lushness altogether, or it might look entirely different from how we picture it today. And so really like driving down that road and literally seeing the trees go from lush green, beautiful pine to charred like ghosts of trees, I think is how you've described them in the past, Monica, too is just like, it was a very stark contrast and a wow moment for us. 
just to add to that also, it's also a great way for us as humans to be like, this is what we're experiencing. This is something that other people, like, can we bring that feeling to other people? Anything else? I, I mean, I was just gonna say that like, by, just by virtue of being there, you're part of like the story within the story too, right? By having the science communicators there and see how you all approach telling a story and how that is similar and different from doing the science definitely, like I said, right, affects how I do that science. And then like very tangible positive effects, like you cooked us dinner twice. And I mean like that is huge for a field scientist. <laughs> Thanks, Simone. And there's a question here. Mine isn't a question. I'd like to see the, the video replayed. All right, we can play it um, at the at the end, just to you know, so people can leave if they ha can't stay longer. Thank you. Hi, I, I really enjoy the science communication aspect of this, but as a scientist, I want to know what type of data do you get in general? I know it's going to be t you can you can go very detailed, but in general, what are you looking at? What are you measuring to get? the effects of the fire on the regrowth? Is it species, the number, of, you know, how big the area is? What, what's the type of data that you're looking at? Oh, how long do you have? <laughs> 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 I could go on a lot for that. Um, in terms of the regrowth, we, we do things like count the number of trees that are coming back. We track the productivity in terms of how fast they're growing. We look at when they're starting to produce cones. We look at the entire understory community. We look at the soils and the nutrient cycling patterns. And so everything from the community of plants to the ecosystem uh, all the way through. And so we've done that in some of the same permanent plots that we've established since um, 1989 are the first ones. So some of these are areas that we go back and we, re we re revisit. In some cases, it's been really interesting because we had the second biggest fire year in 2016 and they burned some of the same sites that I'd been studying since the 1988 fires. And so getting to see what happens when a young forest reburns gave us the opportunity to do all of that. So yes, we go by species. We, we um, have, we, we've done, oh my goodness, so many things <laughs> over many years, but rock solid data and all supported in peer reviewed literature as well. There are many stories on news.wisc.edu about Monica's work over the years if you're interested. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll replay the video for anybody who wants to stick around. Um, this established a baseline in the data that you had or is, is ongoing. Um, and are you anticipating So yes, um, we are continuing to maintain our studies and we are continuing to resample. We'll be out again this summer. We have used satellite imagery in the past. We've also used the um, global LIDAR to do tree heights. We've used satellite imagery. We use it routinely for any of the burn severity measures because aside from the fires that we mentioned today, there have been quite a few others. And we've studied also the interactions between fires and other disturbances like bark beetle outbreaks. Um, one of my other students who's defending his PhD this week has used satellite imagery to look at the areas that are in the park that didn't come back as forest after the 1988 fires. So I mentioned the resilience and that accounted for mo most of it, but there are some portions where the trees didn't come back and those are giving us indications of what could happen in the future. So yes, we have ongoing studies and we'll be out there again this summer. Yeah, so that's because this presentation tonight was to show how the communication was done. And I'd be happy to come back again sometime and give a science talk. I gave one a number of years ago and as part of Crossroads, but it, it could use some updating. So that would get to the, the real science, hard science underpinning. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I do want to give, um, it, coming back to the question to here about how do we reach people too, this is just one thing, right? It's one project. There's, there's an immensity of information um, that, that comes out of Monica's group. And I just want to give her a lot of credit for the work that she does to connect science and community. Um, 
she really does embody this thing we call the Wisconsin idea. Um, every time there's a, a wildfire outbreak somewhere in the United States or in the world and, and reporters are looking for scientists to offer expert commentary and perspective, Monica is often you know, the first one to raise her hand. Um, and that's you know, one of the things we appreciate about you, we appreciate about a university being a resource for the public and, and for being people, being a resource for people who are grappling with some of the, the biggest challenges of, of our time. So thank you all for, for being here tonight. Um, thank you to Crossroads for hosting. Check out the project if you haven't already. Visit the park. The project includes some, some actionable steps you can take if you feel motivated after learning a little bit more about the research there. It is Earth Month. Uh, the university is celebrating a week-long Earth Fest starting this Friday, so if you want to get more involved and more engaged, please do. Thank you all. We'll restart the video for anyone who wants to stick around, but otherwise, please feel free to take off and enjoy your night. All right, special treat. We'll play the longer video for anyone who wants to stick around for that. The Yellowstone landscape remains one of my absolute favorite places on the planet. I feel like I've grown up with these trees. I will say as a scientist, it has just been an absolute privilege to be able to study this system. But Yellowstone will change and it's changing at a faster rate than perhaps we had anticipated. I started in Yellowstone as a ranger naturalist at Old Faithful when I was 19 years old. And that summer is why I chose to become an ecologist. I've been studying the forests in Yellowstone for 35 years. We started during and then right after the 1988 wildfires. So Yellowstone and the 88 fires have given us a benchmark for, for kind of what happens in the historical, the normal sorts of conditions. Fire is very much a natural part of the forest in Yellowstone. We know that fires have burned in this landscape for the past 10,000 years at intervals of about 100 to 300 years. So historically, the forest regrows and it's mature before it burns again. Following the fires, you see just a carpet of tree seedlings coming right back in in the first year. It takes these forests almost 100 years to recover from a previous fire. As the climate is now getting warmer and we're seeing drier conditions every summer, the fire return interval is starting to change. If the fires return before the trees have had a chance to produce cones and have seeds, these immature trees just don't have any seed source. Even if the seeds are available, with a warming climate, the soils may be too hot and too dry for the seedlings to germinate and establish and grow successfully into big trees. 
Many of those vast forests that we see throughout the landscape may disappear and be re replaced by non-forest vegetation. The forests are really struggling now to establish and survive. The climate seems to us to be changing at a faster rate than the tree species are even able to adapt and keep up. But what does that mean for the future of this landscape? How is this iconic area going to change as the 21st century unfolds? So obviously we can't collect data from a landscape that doesn't exist yet, but we also can't wait 40 or 50 more years to see what will happen. Instead, we use computer models which build on our years of past data to explore how the future may unfold, specifically to understand how the carbon emissions that are changing the atmosphere will affect the climate and the fire and the future of the Yellowstone landscape. That gives us an idea of how and where the landscape will change. Some areas may transition actually away from forests and into sagebrush or grassland or meadow. That would mean less trees to provide shade on the trails and along the rivers for hiking and fishing. It would mean that the animal species who rely on older forests will have less habitat. The overall aesthetic of the park is also going to change as the majestic old growth forests disappear. Yellowstone is so well known. It's the world's first national park. It's a good place to both help people appreciate the magnitude of climate change and the potential changes that we'll see in the landscape and to do so in a place that people, they, they love. One of my doctoral students, Timon Keller, is using photographs that we can change based on the results of our computer simulation models that have been well tested and validated for this region and translating those into pictures of landscapes that people see as they visit the Tetons and Yellowstone and the surrounding lands. We've thought a lot about how we can communicate this work effectively and make sure that the results of the models that we produce are intuitive um, and easy for people to understand as they're passing by. And that's where those pictures come in. It is really hard for people to visualize a landscape that they haven't seen yet and to get people to understand the urgency of, of how things may change. And so we hope that by depicting that, we'll help them understand really what changes are likely to happen in the future. This is just such a cool reminder that the science that we do um, matters for people. We want to engage people in that process and share what we find to make people's lives better. And I think that really is something very special about this opportunity. I know that places like Yellowstone are going to still be beautiful. There's still going to be places that inspire us. We know so many changes are coming. They're not going to be the same as they were. But I have hope in the next generation of scientists and in our younger citizens. So many of them have been inspired by the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and they really want to work hard to protect it. We can implement policies to restore the atmosphere, slow the rate of change, and protect Yellowstone and so many other natural areas and the resources on which all of us depend. Yellowstone is going to look different in the future, but how different it will become depends on all of us. Thanks for sticking around and feel free to check out the rest of the stories. There's some other little videos as well about some of the students that were out there with us. Um, and yeah, have a great night. Get home safe. Thanks. <laughs>